dear friends, welcome and thank you for being with us at that webinar organized in collaboration with the Viatris and the International Society of Gynecological Endocrinology. This one will touch one of the hottest topics at that moment, which is the individualization of menopause hormone therapy. You remember, menopause hormone therapy, we were not aware to do some years ago for possible risk and misunderstanding of several studies. But now it's clear that it is a fantastic therapy for health, quality of life, and protection for women. And the question is, does it need to be adjusted properly for each woman? This uh, webinar is uh, done uh, with two lectures, one from Professor Mark Brinkat and one from Professor Panay. I will uh, introduce first Professor Mark Brinkat and at the end of his lecture, Professor Nick Panay. And then we will have a final session of question and answer. Please write your question on the on the touching the specific button in your screen. Uh, Professor Mark Brinkat, uh, he has spent a lifetime involved in advancing women health care. He's professor and chairman and director of the Department of Technical Gynecology in Malta. And with a UK-based training and long experience, he continued to promote this care of teaching, research, and clinical work for many years of service in Malta. And today, in our, please, uh, uh, Mark, you can share your slides. He will make a lecture as, with an answer to a very important specific question, which is when, why, and then how we can balance the benefits and risk in menopause hormone therapy. Please, Mark, you have the microphone. Thank you very much, Andrea, for this uh, lovely introduction. I'll just make sure everything works. And right. We have always some moment of suspense. <laughs> there you are, going. I just have to press a bit more firmly. <laughs> <laughs> right. This is a computer in mind of its own. Right. Okay. Um, okay. Well, it seems I cannot get rid of you. <laughs> okay, all right, good, excellent. So um, thank you very much, Professor Jaratan, for this lovely introduction. Um, and um, I'd just like to say that that MHC or medical hormone therapy or HRT, as, as we in the UK call it, and by the way, I still have a, a post in the UK, uh, it's used... Um, as I was in menopause and treating both short-term and long-term symptoms, as we know. And the risks in both cases needs to be considered, um, both if you're using it for a short period of time and also if you're using it for a longer period of time. Um, now, there's, there's a, a myriad of ways for being able to administer uh, MHT. We're not short of methods. Oral, there's even some transnasal now coming in, spray, transdermal, gels, uh, vaginal, applications of HRT, hormone implants, other depot preparations, and, and in those women who need a progesterone or progestogens, once again, there's oral mostly, but you can also have vaginal preparations. Uh, it is, I have to remind you all that we have stopped beating around the bush and realize that this is the only treatment that is multisystemic, which will treat a number of tissues. My estrogens are important for every single tissue imaginable in a human being, but particularly in a woman. And it is the most effective treatment for treating both short-term and long-term menopausal symptoms. So this is the whole ethos. This is the reason why we use HRT. We use it to treat symptoms. And, um, and various, um, various organizations, various institutions like the IMS and NAMS and EMS have all declared that from an overall safety point of view, HRT, when started early in the menopause, is, is very safe. It's got an overall favorable safety profile. If you're looking at hot flushes, for example, is the only treatment that gives you 80 to 90% improvement within two weeks. And there are several authors who have shown this you know, over the years. Some of these are some of the more, more recent ones. What about the long-term symptoms? Well, we've known for many, many years, decades, that there is a reduction in uh, that osteoporosis is much commoner in women. Long bone fractures are much more common in women than in men. Uh, bone density de de decreases, declines rapidly after the menopause, 
at the rate of about 30% in the first 10 years or so. And uh, these fractures are commoner. And certainly with HRT, even if you look at the WHI study, which we'll discuss in a minute, there was a reduction in osteoporotic fractures. This was realized very, very early on. What about uh, if we use the window of opportunity? Well, if you look at the Manson 18-year follow-up of the WHI data, there seems to be a reduction in mortality from Alzheimer's disease. And if the interventions are done at a particular time, at a window of opportunity, um, then we can also decrease the instance of cardiovascular disease. However, we are not for a minute saying that that estrogen alone therapy should be used uh, at this stage for the prevention of cardiovascular disease or dementia. But off-label, as we were saying before, off-label, this does seem to be the case. Uh, Alzheimer's dementia is much commoner in women than in men, um, but uh, obviously we have to be a bit cautious in advocating this. We do know that, that, that the mortality, and we will see that the figures later on, seem to be less in women who have been on HRT. Um, what are the risks? Well, the real risks are if you use unopposed estrogen without progesterone in a woman with a uterus, this is what unopposed means, then there's a higher risk of uh, endometrial hyperplasias and endometrial cancers. Um, these are easily treatable most often, but really should not be allowed to happen. And we know that this has been reversed completely if uh, cyclic progesterone is introduced or progestogen is introduced or a marina coil or, or a level of gesture contained device is introduced. Um, and this has this problem has been solved by and large. Uh, thrombotic events and CVA, this continues to give us headaches, and we have to be clear about this. We know that with oral contraceptive pills, for example, we have a higher instance of thrombosis. Um, and this also happens with, with various forms of HRTs, but not all HRT is equal. What about breast cancer? This continues to concern a lot of practitioners, and yet very often it's a misreading of the literature. Uh, the literature itself is, is quite clear about this, and we can choose between one estrogen and another, one mode of delivery and another, and what is one progestogen and another, not all progestogens are equal. And this also can be controlled, just like we had controlled endometrial cancer in the past. But we are dealing with a condition that is relatively common. Don't forget, about one in seven women will get a breast cancer during their lifetime. Cholecystitis has been quoted time and time again. Um, we won't discuss it uh, at this stage because it's not that common after all, whereas it's commoner in your um, obese high BMI women. Right, so let's tackle the, the thrombosis story to begin with, okay? So this paper came out in 2019 from the BMJ. Vinogradova is a statistician from the University of Nottingham, where, where I used to be a professor, but she's from the statistics department, not from the Obzingani department. And what they did was to find what's called nested data. Now, nested data are from two databases. There are big GP databases in the UK, which ask all sorts of questions, and from which you can extract all sorts of answers. Now, I, I think the, the, the most important thing that we have to realize early on is that when we say something correlates with something, correlation does not mean causation. I think this, this basic rule needs to be kept in mind just because there's a correlation does not necessarily mean to be to mean that it's causing the problem. Okay, so correlation does not imply causation, it's just a statistical increased um, incidence. Um, it only really is implies causation if you can work out why one episode leads to a different conclusion. Okay, sometimes it can be worked out. So we do know that, that estrogens are thrombophiliac in nature. So perhaps in people who are prone to, 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 to venous thrombosis, this happens. Now, looking at the British Heart Foundation uh, appraisal of this, um, we have to realize, so first of all, not all hormones were, were equal. And, and as I said, going back to this study, uh, what, what they did was they looked at a total of uh, 80,296 women who had a diagnosis of venous thrombosis done uh, 90 days after having been on HRT. Because we know from previous studies that the HRT effect very quickly disappears in women and stops being a cause for thrombosis. So 80,396 women with uh, a of venous thrombosis were looked at, and those who were on HRT were, were separated from those who were not on HRT, and they were compared to 391494 controls um, from the general population. These are patient women who had not had the thrombosis. Now, you can see from this study, uh, and, and as an aside, the British Heart Foundation did say, listen, this is like saying 
Uh, we've got 16 in 10,000 women have thrombosis in that particular age group, and you're going to have 23 in total. Um, so when you talk, when you say that, let's say you've got 50% or whatever higher incidence, you've got to know what the numbers are. Are you talking about 16 in 100 versus 23 in 100, or 16 in 1,000 versus 23 in 1,000, or 16 in 10,000 as opposed to 23 in 10,000, which we are doing here? Obviously, the numbers are important, right? Because when you look at the numbers, these are not such drastic differences after all. And if you look at the RR ratio here, um, I think this is, a, this is an RR ratio. You can see that uh, with 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 the equine estrogens, um, you have a higher incidence of thrombosis than you have with estradiol alone. If they are combined with medroxypristone rest, it always comes in any study as being a, a very um, unfavorable sort of progestogen to use and not desired. No sense, no gesture here. When, and these are combined with combined, uh, conjugated equine estrogens. We don't combine them with these gestogens anymore. But if you look at estradiol alone, 17 beta estradiol, which is the natural estradiol after all, uh, you see that with MPA, you've got a, a, a an RR of 1.44, with norethesterone 1.68, slightly worse, norgesterone and drosperinone 1.42, but with the hydrogesterone here, yeah, uh, you get the least risk. With, with didrogesterone. Okay, didrogesterone is here with just 1.18. So the combination of estradiol and didrogesterone here comes out uh, as better from a thrombotic sort of, um, point of view. So here you can start making judgments as to which HRT and which mode of delivery is the best. Once again, if you look at transdermal estradiol here and combined estradiol, you actually have got a non significant reduced risk of thrombosis, which practically means you're just the same as as as, 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 as you know, all ordinary people from a risk point of view. Tibolone comes out as a 1.02 risk, and raloxifene, which we've known for a while, does increase your risk of thrombosis. Um, and here's the RR factor. Um, different doses, do different doses matter? Yes, they seem to matter because the lower dose of CE uh, gives you a, a higher risk than the higher dose of CE, but the higher dose is, of course, more effective. But if there, if there is... Um, if, you, if, if 0.625 is adequate, then people should be considering sticking to 0.625 as opposed to the higher dose. What about estradiol? Once again, slight, there's slight differences really between one and two, okay, milligrams. Uh, when, when you're combined, once again, you find that gestogens matter with the didrogesterone coming out with our, our, our factors, which are less than, say, norgesterone up here and then CEE. CEE and norgesterone seems to be the worst combination from a thrombosis point of view. Of course, if you select your patients, then you, you're going to do better, okay? And when it comes to transdermal, uh, once again, a higher dose has got a very slight risk, but really you're doing very well from a thrombosis point of view. So from a thrombosis point of view, not all HRT is the same. If you choose carefully, depending on the history of your individual, then you can actually uh, really go a long way into avoiding any risk of DVT or thrombosis, small as that might be. What's interesting is that if you also, if you look at, at the um, <clears throat> different types and you look at people who have had different anticoagulant prescriptions, uh, as opposed to active cases here or anticoagulant uh, prescriptions in recent days, or people who've had recent thrombosis, you find that there's no real difference. The risk is exactly the same. So whether you have had uh, a previous prescription of anti anticoagulant, implying that you've got some risk of thrombophilia, whether you've got uh, an active case of thrombosis and, 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 and the, uh, or you've had anticoagulant prescriptions, a uh, defined case of thrombosis as opposed to just anticoagulation, just as a precaution. Here's a precaution. Here's an active case, uh, an active case in the past, and here's an active case, okay, with a recent thrombosis, okay? Then you can see that um, really these RRs are really no different uh, depending on what you are using. So, so uh, basically, if you've got a history of a thrombophilia, then you are always going to be at risk. But some cases with didrogesterone here, for example, give you a far less risk than others. Uh, Tibolone gives you a far less risk than others. Uh, transdermal HRT gives you a far less risk than others. Natural estrogen gives you a far less risk than CEE. So you can actually choose. Right, what about ages? Once again, you would have told that the older you are, the higher your risk, but this is not so. From, from this particular study, and you can find that uh, whatever you use, 
the risk stays the same regardless of age, uh, more or less, when these figures are the same, and we get medroxyprogesterone always coming out on the limb here uh, with very risk. It's uh, <laughs> apparently here, if you're even older, you get less of risk than if you're in the middle, but it doesn't matter. Dihydrogesterone comes in, becomes better than medroxyprogesterone. There's no excuse now not to be careful in choosing your progestogen. And likewise, transdermal does very well, regardless of your age. You see the age up here? Yeah. Okay. That's very good. Right. Moving on. What about BMI? Immediately, people would say, instinctively, people would say, the higher your BMI, the higher your risk of thrombosis. But once again, this does not seem to matter at all. You know, does it matter very much? Uh, you know, tubulo might matter a bit. Really, it doesn't matter that much. And you can see that most, most of the RRs are very similar. Once again, the ones that are more favorable come out better, and the ones that are less favorable come out worse. What's interesting is, for example, look at dihydrogesterone is about 1.22. And then the the, uh, the the middle ones, BMIs are 1.36, and the, the, the more obese ones are one. So why should there be a difference? You know, basically, what this means is that whatever you use, you are um, having the same pattern appearing every single time. The relaxivine is always coming out worse than tibolone, for example. But once again, I want to remind that the actual numbers in these large number of cases are not that big. The, the, you know, the, the big difference is not big. But you can choose. You can choose. If you think somebody has a thrombophilia, a risk of thrombophilia, uh, then you might want to use a transdermal HRT. You might want to modify your gestation and so on. OK, let's see. Oh, sorry, going wrong way. Here we go. So here's a summary. And the summary is that HRT is a, a very uh, for thrombobilism. If you look at oral combined HRT, and you can see with MPA is about the worst, right? Uh, CE on its own is nowhere near as bad. That's the combination. CE with dihydrogesterone, this has also been looked at, 1.18, whereas with norethesterone, you can see the difference here, which has to be attributable to the different gestogen that is being used. Uh, you're going to use um, an actual estrogen, 17 beta estradiol here. You've got very favorable RR factors, even when this is combined with the gestogen. So once again, uh, an educated choice in which HRT use for the individual needs to be and can be made. Contraindications, well, somebody who's got an obvious elevated risk of clotting, he's got a thrombophilia in the past, um, he's had a, a, a thrombotic episode, retinal vein thrombosis and so on, a risk of CVA, somebody's had a stroke in the past and is still at risk, you know, for some reason or other. Uh, and estrogen sensitive breast or uterine cancer, I think, still has to remain a, a, a contraindication. Uh, some people might want to use maybe local estrogens vaginally, but this is off label. Um, but we have to, uh, you know, have to see, especially these people who are on aromatase inhibitors, fed hysterectomies might have very severe vaginal dryness, but there are alternatives to that, uh, to, use, to use of estrogens, local estrogens. And if you've got a severe liver disease, remembering that liver is the major area for metabolism of gestogens and can provoke uh, liver failure if you, if you give a, a large dose of sex steroid. These are rare. Uh, and the biggest challenge now, switching over to a different problem, is this breast cancer issue. How real is the breast cancer issue? So the WHI study, which was uh, enrolled between 1993 and 1998, hit us in 2001 and 2002, and then we've had episodes being, being uh, published thereafter. Initially, we had a number of women with an intact uterus. They were given CEE and medroxyprogesterone or placebo and no uterus, CEE versus placebo. This study, this study was designed to look at a possible protective effect of, of, of uh, estrogen therapy on uh, in preventing cardiovascular disease. It was not designed for anything else, okay? Uh, so a lot of other problems came out in the wash, so to speak. The study was suspended after five years. Uh, the, well, I, let me correct myself. The, the CEE MPA arm was suspended after five years because there were eight extra cases of breast cancer in 10,000 women, seven extra heart attacks in 10,000 women, eight extra cases of stroke in 10,000 women. However, there were reductions in bowel cancer and osteoporotic fractures, some with significant changes. The CEE arm, the estrogen only arm, on the other hand, showed reductions in breast cancer, not that not, not, not significant, and this carried on for a further two to three years. Um, here you can see this was the first 23% D 
decrease in breast cancer. And this was followed up in 2004, for example, after seven years, this was still the case. There was a decrease in breast cancer events uh, in women who had completed their CE arm and were being followed up for a number of years after, after that event. So this is the completion of the CE only arm at seven years. Then we've had a number of other publications coming up looking at these women as they were being followed up. So the most important study, I, I suspect, is, is, is the 18-year follow-up here. Now, the average age of this, these women was, was some, somewhere in their 60s. They were in the age group that we normally treat. We normally treat women between 50 and 55, say, okay? But we're treating short-term um, symptoms. Um, so anyway, so, so, so let's start off by saying that these women had a high BMI to begin with on average, and that they were an older woman because one of the prerequisites was that they did not have to have hot flushes, no hot flushes. And a postmenopausal woman means that they are older. Um, so 18 years follow up, after all this, the overall mortality, women on hormones versus placebo, exactly the same. So HRT was not killing off women. Um, and uh, as the sort of HRT described, there's no difference either between CE and MPA, CE or placebo in long-term mortality, okay? So, so, so there's no doubt that women on HRT would have been benefiting from hot flashes, sweats, and, and relief of short-term symptoms, uh, which we won't go into. Um, but having scared large numbers of women and putting them off going on HRT, we come here 18 years later, JAMA, the same group, publishing in 2017, showing us that there's no difference in mortality. More importantly, although the CE and MPA had a non-significant um, increase of uh, an RR ratio of 1.44 in breast cancer specific mortality. Uh, the CE alone had at uh, this time a significant reduction in, in, in breast cancer mortality. And this is not surprising because originally the original studies were using estrogens as an anti-breast cancer agent. So even in, in, in cell line studies versus comparing, say, say the fixity of tamoxifen, say, or, or an estrazole, they'd be compared to an estrogen. Okay? Because estrogen was known to be um, apoptotic to breast cancer cell lines, to certain breast cancer cell lines. Um, so here we are, 18 years later, finding a reduction of 45% in, uh, in, in, in breast cancer mortality, uh, which this time was significant. So these are figures which are very similar to raloxifen or tamoxifen, if you remember. Same group. And, and here we can see, I'm sorry about this busy slide, but this is a direct reproduction from from the uh, Manson, Manson paper in 2017. And you can see from breast cancer mortality, for example, it's much less in CE alone and slightly higher in, and higher, uh, in, in women who are on CE and medroxyprogesterone estate. So uh, it doesn't take rocket science. Once again, correlation is not causation, but the difference here is the medroxyprogesterone estate. And there are various ideas as to why this might be so. If you come down a bit further, you can see Alzheimer's dementia mortality. And here you've got significant differences in women who have been on CE alone and in the pooled data and a, a slight reduction in the, in the combined. It, it, you know, so, so yes, Alzheimer, uh, they mentioned this is the best study so far with a large number of patients, certainly a very careful study carried out. There's nothing wrong with, the, with WHI, it's just inter interpretation that's the problem. Um, but the interpretation here, 18 years later, was there were less women dying from dementia uh, in a significant uh, manner uh, in women, particularly who are on estrogen alone, on CE alone. So more work needs to be done in this area. Moving on, we can see. Now, what this slide shows is the clear window of opportunity that we've always been talking about. So here are women have been broken down in, in, in these size in 10-year groups, 50 to 59, 60 to 69, 70 to 79. And while the mortality in these later groups is more or less stable with someone even here at 779 doing well. These are women who are on treatment during these years, okay? So now they're much older, obviously, and there's less of these 779 groups because they've died from natural causes, natural rather causes, okay? But you can see that this group are the mortality, they're doing well. There's less of them dying if they've been on hormones, okay? But the most important group are the group where we actually treat for short-term symptoms. And these are the 50-59 um, year group. And consistently here, they've got, in many cases, non-significant differences, but differences nevertheless, 
in, 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 in mortality, whether it's cardiovascular disease mortality with RR factors of 0.77 and 0.81, whether it's all case mortality, RR factors of 0.62, okay? Uh, pool, the, the pool trials are actually significantly different and TE alone is significantly different. Uh, cancer mortality, they do better. And uh, other mortality overall, they are doing better, particularly CE alone, which uh, reaches a significant level. So, so the, the message, the clear message from here is, if women need HRT in this 50 to 59 age group, this is the ideal time when they will maximize their benefits from the other health issues that they might be having uh, there or in the, in the future um, as, as, as an adjuvant, as, uh, in, in addition to them having HRT for the relief of the symptoms and for improvement of things like skin and so on, okay? Um, so, so this is the clear window of opportunity, whereas if they need it, if they need HRT at later age groups, they're, they're doing fine because they're not going to have an increased mortality from the very fact that they're on HRT, despite the fact that they're beginning treatment later on in life, between 60 and 69. So, so this is the Benson study, and I have to remind you again, it's conjugated estrogens and a progestogen that we don't particularly like called metroxyprogesterone acetate. Now, if you look at some very important French data uh, on different estrogens, this is time, it is 17 beta estradiol. You can see that we can see that the estradiol alone relative risk is 1.29 of developing a breast cancer um, over a period of time. Um, and if they're using natural progesterone, which French like quite a lot, and a lot of this E2 is estrogel, which we had been studying uh, in the Johnstown DNS forever, and has now become very, very popular in the UK. Um, you can see it's one, it's unity, RR. Uh, if we're using the, the hydroprogesterone, uh, um, you can see that that uh, the, 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 the we get very good results as well. So, 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 so <coughs> the, the hydroprogesterone is actually very similar to natural progesterone. We know this because it's in fact an isomer of progesterone. Other progestins, yeah, it goes to 1.69. But the message here, once again, is very clear. What we are dealing with is a an, an increased incidence of breast cancer, small as this might be, of uh, of the, uh, caused by the use of different progestins. <clears throat> Sorry, right here you can see uh, another another analysis of this particular study. You can see the actual, actual cases here. Estrogen only therapy, a few, few breast cancers uh, combined, more or less the same, no big difference. Uh, estrogen versus with natural progesterone, actually less cases than controls, but not very different. Um, if you have synthetic gestogen and tibolone, we do have, there's no controls for tibolone for some reason or other. Um, but this is how the reanalysis of this particular study was, was carried out, and it's not really different to the slide I had shown you earlier. And here we are with the hydrogesterone once again. Um, you can see the instances in breast cancer, uh, and this is over. This is unity here, one. So with micronized progesterone, just one. It's a different way of showing the slide I showed you previously with, with the hydrogesterone here, slightly higher. The synthetic progesterone higher still, and estradiol for some reason or other just uh, reaching levels of uh, this range 1.0 to 1.65 or 1.29. So yes, you can choose once again. You can be selective as to what HRT you give your woman so as to get the maximum benefits from uh, symptom um, response to to, to to lowering risk from both thrombosis and and breast cancer risk. Okay, so. Finally, we have uh, yet again Vinogradov has come over from Nottingham, the University of Nottingham, a statistician, looking at her nested data published again in 2020, a um, couple of years after her initial uh, cardiovascular venous uh, thrombosis paper. And the Q research and the CRPD databases are these big GP databases, right? Well, they've got all sorts of things in them. And once again, she looked at a large number of patients, okay, and compared them to those who have been on various different estrogens, women who are on breast cancer versus controls. And there were differences. Once again, I, I won't go into it. There was another study from, from, from the Million Women study published a, a, a year prior to this, and, and it had all sorts of problems. Um, 
but this seems to be a very well controlled study and and uh, it's not because the results are favorable to us but we it, it, it did show what we knew already that you could actually um, vary your risk depending on what you used so with conjugated equine estrogens you could get reasonably good results um, and these were these were followed up for several years um, and these were women who had been you can see here that that been on estrogen for less than a year which we want four years five years estradiol very close to unity um, and medroxyprogesterone estate once again causing problems levonorgestrel also causing problems in women who've been on treatment for longer than five years okay um, norotesterone and you look at didrogesterone here we seem to up to four years have no difference and then a slight difference that creeps up slowly the women who've been on 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 treatment for greater than five years um these are odds ratios here um all right i think we better carry on these are complex slides uh when it comes to progesterone well and we've, we've realized most of the, of, of the problems are caused by the progesterone that's being used um, so it's not necessary uh, if there's no uterus, then we don't have to use a progesterone because we don't have to avoid, we, have, we don't have to worry about endometrial hyperplasia. Now, if you're going to use a progesterone, a progestogen, the one that's closest to natural progesterone is the best. And we know that that progesterone, for example, is an isomer of progesterone. So either you're going to use natural progesterone, and we know that micronized uh, progesterone uh, is metabolized very rapidly in the stomach. So you've got to have uh, quite large doses to get an effective dose or use uh, something like natural progesterone pessaries, which are very uncomfortable, uh, or else use something that's very close to a natural progesterone to get the best results. Uh, there is a bit of a codicil here, and if you've had a hysterectomy because of endometriosis, then most, most guidelines suggest that you still need to use a gestogen to prevent a recurrence of endometriosis, rare as that may be. Okay, now just a slide to show you that the alternatives to HRT are not themselves without complications. For a while, biphosphonates were touted as being the answer, the alternative to using HRT. Now, first of all, any treatment that's used instead of HRT, is any non-hormonal treatment that is, is not multisystemic. So like biphosphonates are just targeted for bone and nothing else. Um, if you're going to use an SSRI, the targeted for hot flashes and nothing else. Uh, you're going to use a vagina moisturizer, the targeted for the vagina and nothing else. You know, whereas, whereas HRT is, uh, is, is, is steaming as a whole. Um, and biphosphonates, firstly, they, their, their role is to um, knock off your osteoclast, if you like. And you remember that you've got your, 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 um, your bone resorption uh, and resorption cycle going. And, and if you knock off your, your, your osteoclast activity, then the idea is you get a bigger bone mass. But do yes, I mean you do. There's been lots of studies that have shown this. But certainly, we should not be using biphosphonates in younger women, uh, in women uh, as an alternative to HRT, because this in itself uh, means that your osteoclasts are out of action for the rest of your life. You know, and that's you know that's, that is uh, has, it can't be a good thing. Uh, they're inhibitors of bone resorption through their action on on on, on osteoclasts. They will not. They will prevent vertebral and hip fractures, but there are. Side effects, there are biphosphonate rates also in the close of the jaw, for example, which although it's rare, is not as rare as people think. Healing of the jaw after tooth extraction is quite a common thing. People on long-term biphosphonates, and there are these very rare femoral shot fractures. And of course, biphosphonates have no effect on connective tissue in other sites, such as, you know, uh, vertebral discs, or, or skin. There's been no evidence of any of, of any of, of any effect on these sites, although this is not yet published. Um, so, Yes, good, but has to be used appropriately. Certainly not in that window of opportunity when women need HRT, the early ones. Uh, and if you're going to use SSRIs, then these might have effects or central nervous effects as well and cause some somnolence, you know, and some um, some, some, some some lack of 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 of, uh, of suitable expression. Okay, um, so I, I, I won't go into all these because they've all got their problems, um, but it's just suffice to say that it is possible, in conclusion, uh, to assess the risks. We can assess risks, we can assess breast cancer risks in patients. I mean, there are, there are, there are um, ways from a history where you can, you can assess the actual risk of a patient having a breast cancer. Uh, you can carefully select patients, you can carefully select those who are at risk of a thrombosis. Um, there's a history of thrombophilia, as always, a very good history 
is is is, is paramount. Uh, it's it's uh, it's what one needs to take. Um, and you will identify these patients at risk. You also identify patients at risk of osteoporosis through simple questionnaires, which are now available, and then choose the appropriate type of HRT you need. Do you need to treat short-term symptoms, for example, in which case you're going to have an excellent result? Do you need to, to treat local symptoms, such as vaginal dryness, and, and, um, and then come up with, with the best formulation, as we have indicated before? Here are some references, and I thank you all for your attention. I'd like to change. Thank my research fellow for helping me. Thank, thank you very much, Mark, mm -hmm. for that beautiful lecture, very extensive and very precise in your in your achievement, comment, and analysis of the data. It is now my pleasure to introduce uh, the second speaker, which is Professor Nick Panay. Nick is consultant gynecologist and so specialist in reproductive medicine at the Imperial College Healthcare. Trust and Charity and Wilmington Hospital, NHS Foundation Trust in London, is professor of practice at Imperial College of London, and is guest professor in Beijing of Stetian and Gynecology Hospital, Capital Medical University. As director of the menopause and PMS centers at Queen Charlotte's and Chelsea and Wilmington Hospital, Nick leads a busy clinical and research team, which publish widely, present at scientific meetings, and trains health professionals at all levels. And today, he will speak about the individualization of menopause hormone therapy, sequential and continuous menopause hormone therapy, when, how, type, and dose. Please, Nick, you have the microphone. And the general discussion will be at the end. Please send your question on question and answer. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Andrea. It's a great honor to be with you today, and thank you to Beatrice and uh, to ISG for hosting this meeting. Uh, this is a disclaimer about the remuneration by Viatris. Uh, this is important information to say that this presentation is of course to an international audience, fantastic outreach that we get from ISG, but not all of the products mentioned today may be available in some countries. And please do refer to the guidelines relevant to your country when considering use of MHT. And these are my financial disclosures. So what I want to do in the next 15, 20 minutes is really give you the impression of how I approach a patient that I see in my clinic. We run busy secondary and tertiary referral centers where we have quite complex patients referred to us as well as patients with uh, the usual complaints of hot flushes and sweats. But what I'd like to do is provide a practical perspective on how I would think about managing this individual patient and trying to deal with the problems on an individual basis in order to get the best outcome. And this uh, algorithm essentially summarizes that in women, with an intact uterus, we need to think about a combination of estrogen with a progestogen, uh, generally speaking. Uh, in women post hysterectomy, as Mark Brinkat said, uh, we would typically give uh, an estrogen alone combination. But I would like to make a couple of points that, uh, first of all, we need to decide uh, whether we use uh, sequential or continuous combined hormone therapy. Uh, whether we separate out the estrogen from the progestogen component or whether we give something that does everything like tibolone. Um, and potentially for the future, we may also have estrogen plus the serum, although that currently isn't available. And of course, if symptoms persist, we need to think about how we might increase the levels of estrogen in order to fully control the symptoms. And one option where it's available is to insert a, a hormone implant. Although, uh, unfortunately, the licensed varieties are not currently available. Now, when thinking about the different MHT regimens, uh, we can see from this diagram that we can give estrogen alone post hysterectomy. Typically, uh, we can give a cyclic bleed. So what we're doing is we're replicating the natural cycle. If a woman is progestogen intolerant, 
then we may think about giving her a regimen with a quarterly bleed. And in women who don't wish to continue to have periods, uh, then we might try to achieve a no bleed environment. And typically this will be uh, commenced in a woman who is at least one year post final menstrual period. And we try to tailor make it according to that patient's wishes. I have some women that don't mind having periods. In fact, they say to me, it makes them feel younger if they continue to have periods. And so we continue their sequential therapy. Uh, in others, they say, you know, one of the advantages of menopause is not having to have a bleed. So why should I need to continue with that? Let's switch to a no bleed regimen. Now in the perimenopause, so these are women typically over 45 years of age, early menopause is before 45, premature menopause before 40, but in the natural perimenopause, um, there may still be some ovarian activity, there may still be some periods. And the reason we experience, uh, women experience breakthrough bleeding is because of this ongoing ovarian activity, which occasionally can lead to mid-cycle bleeding or breakthrough bleeding on hormone therapy. So for these women, we try to influence the cycle positively by giving them a sequential progestogen uh, with their continuous estrogen. Typically, the progestogen is given for 12 to 14 days, or if they require contraception and they don't have contraindications uh, to being on the ethanol estradiol containing pill, then we may continue the treatment up to the age of 50 with the pill. And then if they want to continue with HRT thereafter, uh, then we can switch them at that point. But if we want to try to achieve a no bleed regimen in women in the perimenopause, this is where we might consider inserting a levonorgestrel intrauterine system, uh, which gives them continuous uh, uh, protection of the endometrium. And the majority of these women eventually will become amenorrheic, although we should counsel them that particularly within the first three months, there may well be uh, significant breakthrough bleeding, and there may also be progestogenic side effects. Now, I don't know if any of you attended uh, the opportunity I had to give a lesson with the ISGRE a short time ago, but we were talking about with Andrea, PMS, PMDD. And unfortunately for some women, this is a perfect storm in the perimenopause where they have PMS, PMDD and menopause symptoms occurring simultaneously. And what we find is that if we give a sufficiently high dose of estrogen with the progestogen, this can actually alleviate the PMS, PMDD symptoms, as well as alleviating their vasomotor symptoms. And I see so many women who uh, see their GPs uh, and the GP say, well, I don't think I can start hormone therapy because you've had a period within the last year. I think it's important for those women who most commonly experience symptoms within uh, a year of the periods starting to become erratic, um, that we, we think about starting sooner rather than later uh, with the treatment in order to avoid unnecessary suffering. In a woman who has had a period, it's important that we start the cycle uh, on day one or day two of the period in order to minimize the risk of breakthrough bleeding. So what is the most commonly used uh, preparations globally? Well, it's the oral combined treatments and in low risk women, this is a good option as an initial treatment uh, with, uh, as I say, women who have a period in less than one year prior to, cessation, uh, prior to starting, uh, then we uh, give them sequential combined uh, menopause hormone therapy in women who are more than a year after the final period uh, then we can consider starting uh, continuous combined hormone therapy. And also we should be thinking all the time that potentially we could switch women uh, from sequential combined to continuous combined therapy after one to two years of starting the sequential regimen. Of course, we then have to carefully select the estrogen uh, and progestogen type and dose uh, and I will come on to that uh, later in my presentation. So this is indicating some of the top tips that I give to my patients and also to my trainees when prescribing hormone therapy. 
uh, for instance, oral combined therapy is a popular, easy to use, convenient and suitable method for most women, but do take into account that individual's risk factors. So if they have increased BMI or if they're heavy smokers or if they're diabetic, you may wish to go uh, with uh, a, a transdermal preparation. You may need to think about whether you give them a, a less androgenic progestogen. Always look at the components and choose carefully. If there are problems in getting symptom control or side effects develop, break the menopause hormone therapy down into its constituent parts and potentially use the estrogen and progestogen separately. Where there is less uh, lack of efficacy or where there are side effects, then these are the situations where doing a blood test may be helpful in assessing what the hormone levels are. The combined patches are convenient, but they are only available in one strength. Transdermal estrogen gel or spray has flexible dosing options, but it has to be used with oral or intrauterine progesterone. Transdermal or oral estradiol plus the levonorgestrel system is convenient, but bear in mind that there can be progestogenic side effects uh, and there may be breakthrough bleeding. The advantage of tibolone is that it can have some androgenic benefits as well as estrogenic and progestogenic effects. And unfortunately, uh, the combination of conjugated estrogens with bazadoxypine is not currently available, but could be an option for women with progestogen intolerance. Now, we don't have time in this short lecture to go in any great detail through these dose regimens, but I would be happy to share this information with you. But suffice to say that with whatever estrogen component we use, we should use a low dose to start with and increase as required. And this reduces the risk of bleeding problems, VTE and CVA, if we start low and achieve the benefits with the minimum fully effective doses. But do bear in mind that younger women and women with POI often require higher doses because these are physiological for their age group. And remember that low doses may not fully alleviate VVA symptoms, so additional vaginal treatment may be needed. And it is frustrating to me that so many women are denied vaginal treatment when they're on systemic therapy because the practitioner thinks that they will overdose if they have vaginal as well as systemic. The dose of vaginal estrogen is extremely low and sometimes equivalent to only one day of uh, systemic hormone therapy per year. So this slide shows a study in which uh, two different uh, dosage regimens were compared, estradiol 0.5 milligrams with 2.5 of digesterone and estradiol 1 milligram with 5 milligrams of digesterone. And there was a placebo arm for three cycles uh, as well. And, and as you can see here, the women with the one milligram dose of estradiol had more spotting and breakthrough bleeding in the first few months than those on the 0.5 regimen. So if you have somebody in whom the spotting and breakthrough bleeding is not settling, then you can switch them to the low dose uh, regimen. Um, but you will see that by cycle eight, um, so if we're patient enough, um, there isn't a, a significant difference between the groups. These are data which indicate that there is a dose response effect as far as VTE risk is concerned. And you've heard in detail from Mark Brinkat about this. Uh, and then the study, they looked at 0 0.3, 0 0.625 and 1.25 milligrams of conjugated equine estrogens showing that there was a dose response uh, increased risk uh, with these combinations, uh, sorry, with these uh, dos dosages. Uh, we can also see these data from the nurses health study that there is also a dose response effect in terms of stroke risk when conjugated equine estrogens are given orally. And we can see that the impact is neutral with the 0.3 milligram dose of conjugated equine estrogens. So the dose of oral therapy, particularly conjugated equine estrogens is important, which is one of the frustrations that the same dosage uh, in the WHI study was given to 50 year old women as it was to 79 year old women. And that's why we saw complications. Okay, what about uh, progestogen? I'm going to talk about sequential and continuous combined. 
um, there are various uh, doses and uh, uh, regimens which can be used with different types of uh, progestogens. And remember that different progestogen groups can have different side effect profiles. So when we're trying to individualize hormone therapy, we try and start with progestogens which are body identical or body similar like progesterone or didrogesterone. But in some women, for instance, who require um, uh, uh, perhaps uh, a more androgenic effect, maybe uh, you want to try to improve libido, sometimes a more androgenic progesterone can be more beneficial in that situation. And if a woman has a problem with one combination, then we can change to a different uh, progesterone to try to achieve a different effect. It's really important to emphasize that there is such a, an excellent range of regulated varieties of hormone therapy that we don't need to uh, turn to compounded varieties of uh, hormone therapy. And these are the dosage uh, regimens that you can see for uh, continuous progesterone. Um, and as I said earlier, this is recommended for women who are 12 months or more after their final menstrual period. The continuous uh, use of progesterone allows us to reduce the dose than if we were using it in a cyclic regimen, and this can lead to less progesterone intolerance. But do bear in mind there may be some breakthrough bleeding to begin with when switching to a continuous combined regimen. So you've seen from Mark that estradiol plus uh, digestrone or micronized progesterone may be associated with less progesterone side effects and less adverse effects on the breast and coagulation. And this is what I would like to focus on uh, in the next few slides. Uh, we can see from this uh, chart of biological activities of progesterone and synthetic progestogens that progesterone, drospirinone, and digesterone do not have an androgenic effect, unlike MPA and levonorgestrel. And this can be important uh, in women who experience skin symptoms such as greasiness of the skin and acne. So, what do we do if we ex if we see side effects in our patients? What would I do? Well, first of all, with regards to estrogen, which is typically the fluid retention type of uh, symptoms due to stimulation of the renin-angiotensin cascade, um, there may be some breast tenderness. I usually try to counsel my patients that these effects uh, will improve with time, but if they don't improve, then we can reduce the dose of the estrogen. We can change the route of administration from oral to transdermal, uh, and perhaps we can go for a less potent uh, estrogen. So if women are receiving uh, a high dose conjugated variety, then we can go to a, a lower dose uh, 17 beta estradiol variety. With progestogens, typical symptoms can overlap with estrogen, such as fluid retention and breast tenderness, but typical uh, progestogenic side effects are the PMS type side effects, which in women on cyclic regimens can often replicate the PMS cycle. I remember uh, Adam Magos published a study with John Studd where in postmenopausal women who'd stopped having periods uh, many years ago, uh, they were given cyclic norethisterone and this returned or restored their, their cyclic PMS symptoms. I don't think the women were particularly pleased with that particular study, but it did prove a point that uh, these gestogens can have PMS type side effects. Now, we've seen uh, the slide from Mark, so I'm not going to go into great detail, but when, when I'm thinking about prescribing in the clinic, I'm thinking about how to minimize risks, and I'm thinking about the data from the E3N cohort, uh, which is also backed up by meta-analysis data, where women who used estrogen plus micronized progesterone uh, and digesterone had no statistically significant increased risk of breast cancer, whereas women using estrogen plus other progestins did have a small but significant increased risk of breast cancer. So particularly for women with a family history of breast cancer, uh, we would want to aim for the less androgenic varieties of progesterone, progestogens, uh, in order to minimize breast risk. And you've also seen these data from the two nested case control studies from the UK in over 80,000 women with BTE 
compared to over 390,000 female controls, showing quite clearly that the highest risk is in the combination with conjugated equine estrogen and MPA, and the lowest risk uh, in women with digestrone and estradiol uh, as far as the oral regimens are concerned, and also uh, low risk with transdermal hormone therapy. So again, these are the sort of thoughts that are going through my mind when prescribing in my patients. And I'd like to finish my presentation by talking you through a typical case that we might see uh, in the clinic where we are trying to individualize hormone therapy, maximizing benefits and minimizing adverse effects by thinking about problems associated with progesterone intolerance and, and bleeding problems. So Sophia uh, was 30, uh, sorry, was 51 years of age. She presented in primary care with a last menstrual period six months prior to that. And prior to that, she'd had quite an erratic cycle. And this uh, uh, woman had a history of premenstrual syndrome. Also, when she was, she was actually very well in pregnancy, but then developed postnatal depression, which is often the case uh, in these individuals that suffer with a tendency to reproductive depression. And she also experienced progestogenic side effects on the POP, uh, and also even when she had a Mirena inserted for contraception uh, in the past. Um, and she was complaining in the past of episodes of breast tenderness, mood swings, and brain fog, culminating also with vasomotor symptoms, uh, as well as these cycle-related symptoms during the menopause transition. She had a family's history of uh, premenstrual uh, dysphoric disorder uh, uh, in her sister, PMDD, and her mother had suffered with perimenopausal uh, depression. She had a, an increased BMI, but uh, below 30 at 28, she was uh, a, a non-smoker. Uh, breast check was unremarkable. There was no uh, abnormality found on pelvic examination and the ultrasound scan of the pelvis showed a just a functional cyst on the left ovary, but it did show some residual ovarian activity. And we could see from the hormone profile that was performed that she was still producing some estradiol at 180 picomoles per liter, and that the FSH level, although elevated, was not within the postmenopausal range, so an FSH of 18 and LH of 16. Uh, I must uh, stress that it is not mandatory to perform a blood test and a scan before somebody started on hormone therapy, but this individual happened to have these investigations performed, partly because her cycle was erratic. So she was initially treated with menopause hormone therapy in primary care. Uh, they started her on a one milligram dose of oral estradiol in a, in a sequential regimen, uh, oral regimen with norethisterone acetate one milligram from day 17 to day 28. And a review was planned for three months. At the three month review, uh, she continued to experience vasomotor symptoms and some cycle related symptoms as well. She also complains of androgenic side effects such as acne, greasiness of the skin and hair during the norethisterone phase of the cycle, and she was referred by her GP to our clinic for further management. We talked through the various options with her, and we decided to switch her to a combined oral hormone therapy regimen of estradiol two milligrams in order to give us better control of her symptoms and a less androgenic progesterone with didrogesterone 10 milligrams from day 15 to day 28. She returned to see us within six months, and we were pleased to hear that her vasomotor symptoms were much better controlled, but she was experiencing heavier withdrawal bleeds on this regimen, probably because she was uh, having more estrogenic stimulation of the uterus. Although we did reconsider the use of the intrauterine system, she was really not keen because of her past uh, experience with it, and she also didn't require uh, contraception because her partner had, had a vasectomy. So we decided to treat her with an additional 10 milligrams of didrogesterone during the luteal phase of her cycle. And we're pleased to hear that, uh, or you'll be pleased to hear, that she had very good cycle control uh, when we uh, increased the dose of didrogesterone to 20 milligrams and she found the progestogen uh, tolerable. So we then uh, arranged for her to return in a year's time. And at that point, 
Uh, she said that she would like to avoid monthly bleeds and try a simplified regimen. She was still getting a few cycle related symptoms, but no, her vasomotor symptoms were well controlled. So we decided to switch her at that point to estradiol one milligram with digestrone five milligrams. We counseled her about the possibility of breakthrough bleeding because of the possible uh, effects of any residual endogenous ovarian activity and also uh, possible return of vasomotor symptoms. Six months uh, after that, she presented to us saying that after some initial breakthrough bleeding, uh, things had settled. She had no return of her vasomotor symptoms and would like to continue on that regimen. And when we returned her to the care of her GP, we said that in the long term, she could be switched to the lower dose regimen of 0.5 milligrams of estradiol and 2.5 milligrams of digestrone uh, if she wanted to continue with MHT. Um, with a view to trying to achieve the benefits uh, with the minimum effective doses. Um, so ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to conclude by saying that I think you've seen from Professor Brinkatz and my presentation that the secret to success with MHT is to try to tailor make it to each individual woman's requirements. And it's also very important that we have a good product range available so that we can vary the dose uh, and individualize therapy because every woman is unique. So every regimen that we give to that woman should be tailor-made to her uh, unique requirements. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Nick, for that beautiful presentation, which was full of suggestions for a clinical point of view. And we have received a huge series of questions. I will start now with some of them. And then I will try to, to follow. We will go from, uh, from one to the other. I will start with Mark with a first question from an anonymous. When discussing risk and benefits, how does alternative treatment compare? You have to open your microphone, Mark. The microphone. You're, wow. you're on mute. Uh, yeah, good, good. Yes, yeah. yes. But well, then weather reports came in. I couldn't get through. <laughs> right. So what was the question again, please? If you... It was... Uh, I will write. When uh, discussing right. risk and... Uh, when discussing yes, risk yes. and benefit, how does alternative treatments compare? Alternative treatments, yes. Well, <clears throat> I mean, if we were talking about things like digesterone. This is menopause hormonal therapy. So we are not talking about alternative therapy. Very often, alternative therapy is useful as an adjunct, not as a primary um, uh, form of therapy. So if you want to use for vaginal atrophy, for example, there are several uh, vaginal moisturizers around, and there's also a vaginal um, pack that you might want to use. Of vaginal mask, vulvar mask. So, uh, if you want to use um, phytosoy, for example, you might get some blunting of your hot flushes, but not to a, a great degree. Not the same degree you get as HRT. And there are lots of moisturizing creams for your skin, for example. So, so yeah, there is a lot of alternative therapy around out there, the laser for your vagina, maybe. Um, but none of them are multisystemic. None of them would affect the whole person. And, and none of them, and, and, and it depends what alternative treatment you're talking about, because some of them do have side effects as well. Okay, so, uh, so if you're using, uh, I know, an SSRI, for example, uh, this is not free from side effects. Um, by phosphorus was spoken about. So once again, you have to, as, as, as Professor Panay said, you've got to individualize therapy and use adjuncts. I mean, if you want to use a small dose of vaginal estrogen with a vaginal moisturizer, you might get a better result in severe VVAs. Or you might want to treat some incontinence, for example, with um, anticholinesterase. Thank you. And then now one, one question. Can I, can I make Nick, a comment? Nick, well? Yes, absolutely. Please, please. Um, so I very much uh, agree with what Mark has said. I just wanted to add that um, um, we do need to think about alternatives. Some women don't want to use MHT or some women are contraindicated to it. Um, and another option that we're working on at the moment are the neurokinin receptor antagonists, which are an exciting uh, new, not new line of investigation, which are showing uh, similar efficacy for vasomotor symptoms to MHT, but as Mark says, doesn't have that multi-systemic 
effect, but it can help with sleep and mood from some of the phase two clinical trials that we've done. So um, yes, I, I think we need to try and have a broad armamentarium of alternatives as well. Thank you. And I, I now, agree with that. I agree with that entirely. <laughs> we have, well, we have a Nick one question from uh, uh, Dr. D. Keeney from United Kingdom, uh, which is interesting. She is mentioning in her personal experience, over 93% of patients did not want to stop hormone therapy, but unique uh, for, but continue longer period. Then the question is, uh, uh, what do you believe about the necessity to stop after five years? Well, there isn't one. Um, and uh, the, uh, the societies such as IMS, BMS, ISG, EMAS, et cetera, don't talk about um, putting arbitrary limits on duration of use. What we talk about is uh, treatment that is reevaluated on an annual basis, carefully weighing up the pros and cons and deciding at that point whether treatment is continued. So for some women, it may be that they never have to use hormone therapy. For others, it may be a few years. Only today in the clinic, I saw an 80-year-old, last week a 90-year-old, who was still experiencing vasomotor symptoms. And in those individuals, we continued the treatment because the pros were deemed to outweigh the cons. Yes. And uh, uh, thank you very much. Is there one, another one for, uh, for uh, probably for Mark? Uh, is uh, uh, what do you think about Tibolon? Uh, for example, uh, for women with 14 years menopause and vaginal dryness, uh, vaginal estrogen did have effect. And uh, uh, and then what do you suggest about Tibolon and the possible, and also some comment about Tibolon possible breast cancer risk? I think Tibolone is a very good underused uh, preparation. Yeah, um, it, it is very similar to a progesterone type of drug. Um, it, it, it does sometimes cause some stimulation of the endometrium, but otherwise it's very efficient in stopping short-term symptoms and has been shown to increase bone mass uh, and also to increase um, vaginal lubrication. Uh, and there's always been some suggestion that it increases libido as well. So yes, it is a good preparation. It does not uh, give rise to periods, you know, so this is uh, an advantage to certain women. Um, the breast cancer risk has been shown in the Billy Women study to be very similar to an estrogen, uh, but in the um, in, in, in the Liberate. I have shown it's exactly the same. It's actually uh, it's got an R factor of one. In the Vinogradova study, you know, so it, um, so I think there is maybe a small increase risk, but the numbers are, are very very small. Um, I don't think if Nick, I don't know if Nick would like to add something. I think I think it's it's it's, it's in, in the right hands. And in certain societies, Tibolone is a, a great preparation and a great, um, a great drug to use. Then, yes, I, I agree with what Mark has said. Uh, I would just like to add that in younger women, mm -hmm. um, I don't find it sufficiently estrogenic. Um, yes. <laughs> and uh, they quite often have persistence of their symptoms. Uh, but it is, as you say, good, uh, particularly if they experience, from the point of view of my lecture, adverse effects like breast tenderness and breakthrough bleeding, which is much appears to be lower with, with Tibolone. There is, there is an interesting question, which is also a comment from Elahi Najer. She is asking, what is the mechanism for decreased breast cancer by menopause hormone therapy? I was mentioning to the WHI data with only conjugate equine estrogen treatment. And uh, this is always a question which is uh, in the mind of all the people when they look uh, to this slide. I would like a comment from both of you. Yes, well, I mean, even if you look at Herian's data, for example, estrogens occupy estrogen receptors. So the tendency there is to have, uh, the original study showed estrogens to be apoptotic to breast cancer cells. And if you look at the range of decrease in breast cancer rates, these are very similar to those that you see with tamoxifen or reloxifen, for example. And the idea is that by blocking estrogen receptors um, or by occupying estrogen receptors, you can get um, your, your estrogen cell lines becoming normalized and your abnormal cell lines being apoptotic. This is the theory anyway. Uh, it's the only theory that I can explain why you've got estrogens having similar um, 
rates as tamoxifen, for example, in breast cancer rates uh, in, 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 in the IBIS-1 trial, for example. Maybe so, the other theory, Mark, is that conjugated estrogens uh, potentially have a CERM type effect as well yes. because of the different types mm -hmm. of estrogen within it. Um, and uh, in fact, uh, the work that you very nicely presented at mm -hmm. the RSM with S-Tetrol shows yes. that an estrogen can behave as a CERM, although we're not allowed to call it a CERM. Yes, yes, exactly. Yes, I mean, I mean, the, 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 the CEE is a particular combination of molecules. Several attempts to find the active metabolite have failed. And it is a nature, a natural molecule, group of molecules that works as it is. And we've got several examples of this. So yes, it might work as a sort of CERM, but, but even 17 beta estradiol does the same, you know? So, you know, there's more to the story, but certainly CEEs themselves are the ones that have been shown to have 18 year data uh, with a breast cancer rate of, of 0.55. And as, as Nick quite rightly says, you've got to look at the group of molecules as a whole. You can't really um, extract one. Uh, the similar, similar case comes to mind is cannabis, right? With great cannabis, all these studies with cannabis. Everybody is trying to get the, the molecule, the cannabinoid that is active. It just does not work. You've got to have the whole group as God created it, <laughs> or as she created it, you know, uh, if you want to get that particular effect, the great laboratory of, of life. <laughs> yeah. and, now, and now, Nick, we have a question for you. You were mentioning the, the, the white product range. And then the question is, how is it important to have a white product range when trying to individualize menopause hormone therapy? Yes, I mean, I, I think my presentation really was geared to show that um, um, a wide product range enables us to um, tailor make, to, to, to give a bespoke hormone therapy regimen, because every woman uh, is different. Her sensitivity to hormones is different. Uh, her response therapeutically um, is different in terms of efficacy and, uh, and adverse effects. And uh, in situations where you only have one uh, regimen within the range, then it makes it so difficult to individualize treatment unless you then prescribe off-label. Um, and I think one of the big lessons from WHI, as Mark said, was that we were trying to give the same regimen to 50-year-old and 79-year-old women. And then it wasn't surprising that we saw significant uh, adverse cardiovascular incidents within the 60 and particularly the 70-year-old um, uh, age group. So we need to individualize dosage. Uh, we need to individualize the progestogen type. Um, and we also need to think about duration of treatment according to that uh, person's requirements uh, according to the symptoms that they have uh, short-term and long-term and also uh, their metabolic uh, and other risk factors. Um, and that's the art, if you like, of hormone, good hormone replacement. That's how we minimize side effects and maximize benefits. Yes. I have to quickly add, if you don't mind, to, to, to Nick's excellent comment, that the thrombotic risk, for example, is only present in the first few months. Um, and if you get past those first few months, that thrombotic risk declines rapidly on persistent use of HRT. And also what I did not explain properly in one of my slides, the Vinagradova ones, is that the risk of, 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 of a thrombotic event goes back to normal very soon after stopping HRT. Yes. So we move back to normal very quickly. We have a what we want to try to do is avoid that initial risk as well. Yeah, exactly. This is right. By tailoring your treatment, as you said. <laughs> with high risk cases. You know, in the old days, we used to start with a high dose because we thought it's better to, to treat the symptoms effectively. But then we realized that the higher doses led to a greater prothrombotic risk. Now we start with lower doses. We accept uh, perhaps less of a therapeutic effect to begin with. But if we appropriately counsel our women to say, right, this may not fully alleviate your symptoms, but you're much less likely to get side effects. Then you increase the dosage and you achieve the full benefits without any side effects. Uh, uh, I think you know, they, that's a much better way to do it. And also we have, a, I think it's important that, that question here, that how relevant is the window of opportunity? When is the best moment to initiate the hormonal therapy? 
It's a question mm. for Mark, I think. Okay, well, yes. uh, I mean, WHI illustrates it beautifully, actually. And that's the, 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 the decade when we, all of us, start living on HRT, when women come and ask for HRT. They're not coming to ask for HRT for protection against breast cancer or prevention of thrombosis or CVA. They're coming to ask for HRT for their short-term menopausal symptoms, of which there's a myriad of them, including, I think, the important brain fog and things like that. Um, so the best age is really at the time of the menopause, which is on average is 51.6. It's diagnosis that's made one year retrospectively. Um, you can start HRT in the perimenopausal period as well when the women are in their 40s and they start getting fluctuations of hormones, remembering that several side effects happen, not because there's an absolute absence of estrogen, but because there are fluctuating levels of estrogen, estrogen yeah. going up and down. So there, there you, can, you might want to use different um, preparations which will abolish the cycle and, and impose their, uh, your own cycle onto it, you know? So, so really 45 to 55 is the optimum time to start, but whenever women need it, that's the answer, and then tailor accordingly. If a woman is complaining of vaginal dryness later on, tailor accordingly. Thank you. One of the points which I'd like to emphasize, which John Stevenson always makes in his presentations, is just because we are beyond that window of opportunity does not mean to say that we may not still achieve benefits, exactly. but yeah. we have to be more cautious in terms of yes. our prescribing and start with lower doses. Um, so I think it's, and then the other thing to emphasize is that this window of opportunity shouldn't be applied to women with premature menopause, you know, mm -hmm. premature ovarian insufficiency. Yes. We have women who are 10 years after their final menstrual period who may have had their final menstrual period at the age of 35. They should still be given hormone therapy at the age of 45 if they present yes. late, uh, because they may still be prevented benefit at that point. Uh, and they're less likely to have had the same amount of uh, build up of atherosclerotic plaque during that time as a 60 to 65 year old or 70 year old would have had. Then we have Nick, one question from Sebastiao, Fre Sebastiao Freitas de Medeiros de, de Brazil. He's asking what criteria should we use for changing from sequential to combined continuous regimen? Only age, year of use? Well, I mean, the most important criteria is whether the woman wants to try switching from sequential to continuous combined. Um, it is clear that if a woman has gone through an earlier menopause, um, then they tend to have more persistence or unpredictability of endogenous ovarian activity. And so it can be more difficult to achieve a no bleed regimen. And one little trick, which I wasn't allowed to put in my slides, but I can talk about verbally, <laughs> is what I call the Pane regimen. I mean, I'm sure everybody else does it as well where I tell women switching from sequential to continuous combined, I'm not sure whether they still may have some endogenous ovarian activity. So I say use the progesterone or progesterone continuously for as long as you can, and then have a four day break if you experience cramping or breakthrough bleeding. Can I just emphasize this is off label and off license, uh, but it can be useful for those women who are keen to switch sooner rather than later uh, and we're not sure if they still have uh, um, endogenous ovarian activity. And also, uh, also I think uh, still from uh, Michelle Moreau, she is asking, you have mentioned, uh, Nick, uh, the quarterly use of a progestin with continuous estrogen use. And she asked, if this, are you sure that this can offer a sufficient endometrial protection? Um, I don't uh, favor quarterly regimens. Uh, I, I don't start them routinely, and I only use them um, in women who have severe progesterone, progesterone intolerance, where I am prepared to accept a potential small increased risk of endometrial hyperplasia. And the studies that have looked at quarterly regimens do show that there is a higher incidence of endometrial hyperplasia than women who are using monthly sequential regimens. Thank you. And then now, uh, this is for Mark. Uh, Ash Yarsi is asking, in case of breakthrough bleeding, when should we make an endometrial biopsy? Or is there a routine place for uh, of ultrasonographic endometrial evaluation through the hormone replacement therapy? Uh, I, I think ultrasound is very always very useful. And if, if you've got um, an endometrial thickness of less than 0.7 um, and not in excess of 1.2, then you are 
probably justified in waiting. Um, on the other hand, if you keep on getting persistent endometrial spotting and bleeding, and throughout the time you spot something like a polyp, for example, or uh, or excessive endometrial thickness, you know, then you are justified in doing perhaps a pipel. A pipel uh, would give you a good sample. If you have a polyp, you've got to remove the polyp. Nick, there are two mm. questions uh, which I would like to put that are quite important. One from Kan Postak. Uh, what should be the optimal menopausal therapy for breast cancer survivors and how long after the termination of the, onco of the oncological therapy would you recommend? And the other was in a breast cancer patient uh, without estrogen or progesterone receptor, can we use menopausal hormone therapy? Okay, well, I would like to emphasize in this sponsored symposium that using menopause hormone <laughs> therapy after breast cancer is contraindicated, um, yes. whether it's estrogen receptor negative or positive. Having said that, uh, we do have to find practical solutions for our patients with severe symptoms uh, who don't necessarily respond well to the alternatives which we talked about earlier. So in women with uh, hormone receptor negative breast cancer, we do feel more comfortable prescribing in that situation because we don't think we will increase the risk uh, of recurrence of a hormone receptor negative breast cancer. However, women with a hormone receptor negative breast cancer have a greater risk of a phenotypically hormone receptor positive breast cancer in the future. So we can't uh, completely negate against that. But again, it's very carefully weighing out the pros and cons. In terms of the best types of hormone therapy, I mean, we just don't have the data to say. If we work on first principles and we look at data from the E3N cohort, from Cecile, <laughs> these weren't studies looking at women with a prior history of breast cancer, but working on first principles, combined regimens with uh, micronized progesterone or digesterone would seem to be uh, the best way forward. Uh, again, probably trying to achieve uh, these regimens with the minimum effective doses. One thing I will say is that what we have started to do, and we're hoping to publish a case series, is looking at women who are on tamoxifen or who have stopped tamoxifen, restarting it, and using the hormone therapy combined with tamoxifen. Because in those situations, um, you can still achieve a benefit in terms of relief of symptoms, but potentially they're experiencing some protection from continuing uh, the tamoxifen. Uh, again, this is on a theoretical basis, but we do have some data from the Stockholm study in Sweden, which showed that women given HRT with a higher percentage using tamoxifen than the HABITS trial from Sweden had a, uh, a lower incidence of recurrence of breast cancer. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And then now, Mark. Is there, uh, there's one alternative here. I mean, you might want to consider the use of raloxifene, you know, in such cases. Um, just adding on to what Nick said, you know, uh, we, we wish we had a CERMS estrogen preparation, but even that, you know, around, around some, we will give on some headaches. But certainly, uh, raloxifene has got a very good track record. It's a cousin of tamoxifen, if you like. Uh, tamoxifen use has been extended now, as you know, from five to 10 years. Um, in, um, and in these cases, perhaps you'd want to opt for tamoxifen as opposed to something like an aromatase inhibitor, for example, which would make the situation much worse. And then the question remains, do you use uh, at the 10 or 10 microgram, your very low dose vaginal uh, pessary twice a week in women who, you know, make, for example, women who are on aromatase inhibitors who've got severe pain. And that, is a really, that is a very important point, Mark, isn't it? That yes. um, we do have some reassuring data mm -hmm. that women using tamoxifen with vaginal estrogen, observational data, yes. case control data, that they don't have an increased risk of recurrence. Um, to, with an aromatase inhibitor, um, I think it's, it's slightly problematic. I mean, we do yes. sometimes use it, again, off-label in extremists, mm -hmm. but it, it's counterintuitive to give it to somebody in whom you're trying to reduce their estrogen levels to nothing. Yeah, but a small dose of vaginal estrogen, you know, with a local effect um, might be okay. But the other thing is with the mm -hmm. raloxifene, 
Mm -hmm. um, that's not going to have a great effect on their vasomotor symptoms. It'll be good no, for their bones, the potentially, and, and cardiovascular, but not, not for VMS. Yeah. That's it. So th this is one case where I would tend to use an SSRI. We do get, I, I don't put people off SSRIs, we do get very good results with a 60% reduction using an yeah. SSRI, those, those SSRIs. There's nothing wrong with combining an SSRI with fluoxetine, for example. Um, tamoxifen with, 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 with a low dose of vagina estrogen, yes, aromatase inhibitor, it is a problem, but they're the ones who get the worst vaginal atrophy because the spermatic ones have a hysterectomy. So, we've, uh, we've seen some good outcomes with oxybutynin recently. Yes, uh, this is true. And uh, there are a couple of randomized trials. There's about, mm -hmm. uh, in the UK, they're about to start a, a big multi-center trial yes. of oxybutynin. And now we have also, a, a, with, the, with the epidemic of overweight that we have in the world, we have a question uh, from Oltea Ionescu. She asks, how should menopause hormone therapy be tailored for overweight or obese menopausal women? What are the particularities, if they are? Well, we've seen we've seen the thrombosis data where obviously it doesn't really matter, particularly if you're using transdermal estrogen, low dose transdermal estrogen. Um, don't forget that obese women have their own endogenous estrogen because uh, they're, they're having an increased conversion peripherally of their, their cholesterol to estrogens. So yes, uh, there, there's room for, for, for um, transdermal. These women are more at risk of developing endometrial hyperplasia, so maybe uh, a level of gestural um, trace device would be useful here. Um, and I'll take it from that, you know, Vinix with any feelings. <laughs> No, I agree with you. I think we need to give combinations that are low dose, um, mm -hmm. that are metabolically favorable. Um, and these are the principles of prescribing in women with increased metabolic risk. One thing to say is that uh, the incidence of diabetes, uh, first do no harm, of course, get the dosage right, get the mm -hmm. roots right. But the incidence of diabetes uh, is actually reduced in women using estrogen with metabolically favorable gestogen. So, um, you know, it's not all bad news. And then now we have a question for you, Nick. Why does breakthrough bleeding occur with no bleed menopause or hormone therapy? And what are the strategies to minimize that? Well, it's usually because of persistence or resurgence of uh, um, endogenous ovarian activity uh, that they get breakthrough bleeding. Uh, and, um, you know, when we investigate women with postmenopausal bleeding, only 10% uh, end up having uh, malignancy. Uh, the rest um, probably have that bleeding because even in their 60s, sometimes maybe in 70s, they have a, a free song of uh, ovarian estrogen release or maybe a little bit more transient androgen production um, rheumatized to estrogen. So, you know, it, um, um, it's important that, uh, uh, you know, we uh, think about the potential reasons because we don't want to, as we say in the UK, throw the baby out with the bathwater. If a woman has been on a perfectly good regimen, she has a couple of episodes of breakthrough bleeding, she doesn't necessarily need to change the regimen. But the typical... Uh, 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 modification of the regimen might uh, include reduction of estrogen or an increase uh, in dose of, of the progestogen, or if it's persistent consideration of, of an intrauterine system. Just a final thought, which is that you see some women who have a, and Mark will tell you this as well, perfectly atrophic endometrium, they've had hysteroscopies, biopsies, et cetera, and they continue to have breakthrough bleeding. And these women, it's most likely to be capillary fragility rather than thickening of the endometrium. And sometimes these women actually benefit from having some estrogen. Yeah, that's a try. Open-ended blood vessels, we call them, <laughs> because there's no, there's, there's no basement membrane at all. Yeah, so. It's that weeping, that yes. sort of sludge mm -hmm. that some women talk about. So a bit of estrogen, and that's it. It will restore some of their endometrium and plug the vessels. Mm -hmm. And now... Yeah. And now we have also a question that I like very much from Isakova Zilditz. Uh, what about cognitive function? Which progesterone is good? Ah, this is... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I mean, I, 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 Nick, I, I'm not aware uh, there's been any 
real studies of cognitive function. There's, there's been lots of studies where, unfortunately, these studies were stopped in their tracks with the WHI yes. study. But, but the what, I, what if I can do, tell something is what we yes. have to do is to mm -hmm. avoid to use uh, progestogens yes. to interfere in 5-alpha uh -huh. reductase central activity, yes. which is yeah. the key, uh, the mm -hmm. key uh, enzyme mm -hmm. for the production of allopregnanol. Already, yes. allopregnanol is decreased yes. during pregnancy. With estrogen, we rise, yes. and we have to use yeah. or progesterone or dihydrogen. Or I would agree. You need natural progesterone for that. Natural there progesterone. Is a, <laughs> there is a study where they compared natural progesterone with MPA. Uh, and, yes. found, and did cognitive functioning uh, tests mm -hmm. and found that cognitive functioning was superior in women being, using natural progesterone. Yes. Uh, well, natural progesterone is, is a precursor. It is also a somnolescent and it's also a mood changer. It makes you um, slightly euphoric. And um, then, so, say natural progesterone. But we, but we need better data. We need better data. All, all, all those studies, regrettably, yeah, were terms. stopped. We're yeah. stopped with WHI. That's, that's the sad thing. Then, about it. And then uh, now, dear friends, we are approaching to the end. I have just uh, took one question for Nick. Uh, it is uh, what causes progesterone or progesterone intolerance, and how can we reduce the chance of this happening? Well, it does seem that some women are genetically predisposed to progesterone uh, intolerance. Um, and so, um, you know, we, we use uh, the model of PMS, PMDD, this to, to explain it, where women with PMDD appear to have differences in their single nucleotide polymorphisms uh, in, for the estrogen uh, receptor uh, compared to um, controls. Um, and I think it's the same group of women. We look back at their premenopausal uh, pre history to see uh, these same women suffering with progesterone intolerance that suffered with PMS, PMDD when they were younger. Um, so the, the trick for the future will be identifying these women before we start regimens so that we can predict this response and prescribe accordingly. That's the brave new world, pharmacogenomics. Uh, uh, <laughs> And then, and then for, um, for Mark, is there any difference in risk between low dose and high dose menopause hormone therapy treatment? Well, it depends uh, what, what for. There is a slightly higher risk of thrombosis with the high, high doses uh, of estrogens. Um, gestogens very much depend on which gestogen you are talking about. With digester, there's no real risk. No? If, if you're talking about breast cancer risks, then it's very much dependent, once again, on the gestogens that you are using. We now know better, okay? The, um, the, the, the differences between higher and lower doses are insignificant, to be honest. Um, and and uh, from looking at the WHI data was just one single dose. Um, and, and uh, looking at the French studies, uh, you know, those were, were, were mostly gels, so it's, it's, it's very difficult to tell. Um, but let, let me give you an off-label opinion. <laughs> from, I don't, from a breast cancer point of view, I don't think these are those methods, uh, because we've got lots of experience using hormone implants. We've not seen any, any differences. And then, um, Nick, <laughs> we have an anonymous who put a nice question, which sometimes the hot flashes return while using HRT. Why? Um, well, I think the commonest reason for symptoms returning is because endogenous production continues to reduce in women in their 50s. So the dose that you started with initially, which was compensated for by residual endogenous estrogen production is no longer adequate. So initially, I find that you have to increase the dose before you then decrease it as women become more hormone sensitive in their 60s, if you are going to continue it for as long as that. But that's a very interesting question. Thank you for that. Oh. Uh, we have, uh, this is the last question. Then I will ask both of you to make a final comment because the time is already moving. We have received a question from Anand Srubamani Rajagopal, I believe from India. <laughs> Greetings for the nice interaction. Do the non-vegetarian food interact with dosage? Not non-vegetarian food. I, I, I take that to, to mean a, a steak, basically. <laughs> Eating <Yeah>. a steak. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, I mean, uh, uh, there's a problem with water, by the way. You know, I've been told by somebody who re recycles water in the Thames Valley region um, that, uh, that, that, that the hardest thing to get rid of is the ethanol estradiol from the contraceptive pill um, in, in, in trying to purify water and recycle it. So, so mm -hmm. we have that issue. And, and, and the other thing, that, uh, and so this, this also has some bearing on the sort of meats that you are eating, okay? Because there are some um, some meats, even by EU standards, which allow the use of some sex steroids in them, okay? But otherwise, no, really, okay? Because because this is no excuse to forego your meat. <laughs> but I, 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 there's been some study now that shows that 94% um, of vegetarian girls, probably eating an inappropriate vegetarian diet, are underweight. <laughs> in the UK, just been published today. Um, so, so I, I find no reason as to why a, pro, a high protein diet should interfere with your should interact with your estrogen <laughs> dosage. I, I always yes, say yes. quality rather than quantity. Go for free range, or better <laughs> still game which is free to fly. This is for everything and, in life for quality but not the quantity always and now four kilo the, chicken which is four kilos in six weeks is suspicious and now <laughs> a, a question or, or which is, or a, a request to help for the general practitioner and gynecologist facing our patients how do we counsel women to ensure they do not discontinue menopause hormone therapy within the, the first three months of treatments as normally happen <laughs> well, I'd like to think that we're moving into an era where women aren't discontinuing within the first three months. I mean, quite a lot of the data came from older studies where we were using too high a dose, too um, little thought about the gestogens that we were using with the estrogen um, and less individualization. So I think what this webinar has hopefully shown is that with appropriate individualization and counseling, of that individual that if there are any adverse effects within the first three months, they will normally uh, improve. And also counseling that you don't expect uh, a, a transformation overnight, that it can take yes. two or three months to see the full benefits uh, coming through. I think through appropriate counseling and appropriate prescribing, then we can achieve appropriate outcomes. Okay, then now another question rise. Uh, is uh, when the patients she feel well under therapy and then you have adapted therapy to according to their needs, how long she can continue? Well, oh, I think we've already okay. answered that, haven't we? But, sorry. My wife, she's still doing. Eh? And then... um, we, we don't place arbitrary limits on duration of use. Um, we individualize. Uh, we see the woman regularly, either in our clinics or in primary care to discuss the pros and cons on an annual basis. And if she still has symptoms or other benefits that we think um, you know, are favoring usage and she doesn't have uh, risk fact, significant risk factors, then she should be allowed to continue. Absolutely. Okay. And then we have still 250 people with us, 250. I would like Hello. to have the final comments at the end of this uh, beautiful webinar for uh, Mark and Nick. Okay. We will start uh, with Nick as it was the second in speaking, and then uh, Mark, you will make, you will conclude. Please, Nick, your final message to that beautiful group of people following us. I, what I've tried to do in my presentation is um, transfer some of the information uh, that I have picked up over the last 30 years or more in menopause practice um, in order to facilitate the management of women uh, globally. Uh, because menopause uh, or middle youth, as I like to call it, is a key time in a woman's life where we can make a huge difference, not just in the short-term quality of life, but long-term well-being. And it is almost totally dependent on what we prescribe. Um, when we hear from uh, the media, it sounds like there is one preparation for one type of woman. Actually, we need an armamentarium of treatment choices so that we can truly individualize in order to achieve uh, the optimum outcome. And as long as we do that, then we maximize her quality of life and her long-term health. Thanks. And then Mark? 
We're all right. Uh, we, uh, as, as Nick said briefly, we are following you on the steps of a lot of work that has happened before us and throughout our 30, 40 year career in our case. Um, women are now much better informed than before and, and women do vote with their feet. And we can see the pendulum has swung right back from the scaremongering that there was 20 years ago. So, so, so we see, for example, in the UK now um, that uh, how long how long does a woman stay on treatment for? Well, a woman stays for as long as she likes under proper care. If she stops, she will soon know if she needs to go on HRT or not, because she will realize herself that she's either feeling well or she's not feeling well. And, and we'll go back on HRT. HRT is not just of multisystemic importance, it's also of general health importance. Women are living longer than before. Um, we all have 90-year-olds who are still on HRT and doing very remarkably well. Um, but the point is that women are, are better informed, and we are seeing now the, 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 the fact we've got an armamentarium. We have to individualize treatment more, but treatment is becoming more readily available because of these swings in opinion. We can see in, HR, in the UK, for example, HRT is being sold over the counter. You know, I, I've got reservations about this, but it is being sold over the counter. You know, we, we hardly need for a prescription. Uh, there are shortages of HRT. Whoever would have dreamt there'd be shortage of HRT. Um, th there are people campaigning to be treated better in their place of work in the going through menopause. Cases are being won against employers who mistreat women for uh, making fun of them because of their menopause. I'm not using the proper English word here, but they're making fun of them. And, and these cases have been won. These are revolutions in care. When it is realized that women at 50 is at the peak of her career should not be, and should not be impeded from working to her full potential because of a lack of available knowledge, uh, uh, false knowledge in, in, in some cases, right? Scaremongering and the lack of available HRT. So the world is moving in these advanced societies. Um, you know, a woman who's age 50 has still got 15 to 20 more years left to work, at least, at least, you know? Why should she be impaired? And she knows. And they know, and, 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 and the movement now that we have, once again, got a huge interest in HRT is to do what Nick said and get back on track with our studies, our studies in cognitive function, our studies in cardiovascular disease, our studies in oncology. Now is the ideal time for pharmaceutical companies to start rediscovering the potential of HRT, investing in HRT, and carrying out, letting us carry out the appropriate studies in the various branches of this fascinating topic. And also, I think we have to make more education of the uh, mm. actually working general practitioner, gynecologists, all people involved in this area, because sometimes a lot of confusion rise in the mind of the patients because their doctor, they have not so clear uh, evaluation yes. of what menopause is, what are the possibilities of menopause hormone therapy? What are the concepts that Nick and Mark expresses on the importance of the individualization of the wide range of armamentarium that we can use and how we have to help women, not only to have a longer, but a healthier life with better quality, not only for her, but also for us, for all the family, children, girl children, Husbands, they want to have a healthy woman close to her who can help in the daily life. Dear friends, thanks, thanks, thanks a lot. Thanks, Nick. Thanks, Mark, for the beautiful presentation. I would like to thank Viatris for the help in the organization. And then I would like to thank the more than 200 people still present today. And I would like now to go to that post-webinar survey that we have. You, all the participants, they will, you will receive access to that post-webinar survey. Please help us in going up and in improving our activity by answering to this webinar survey. This is done to evaluate the effect of what Professor Brinkat and Professor Panay have presented today and what also was the impact of the question and their answer. And then with that, I would like to thank all of you of being with us at that patient's perspective in front of hormone replacement therapy. And this will be the next, I'm sorry, this will be the next, the next uh, uh, webinar will be the 14th of September. I thank Viatri for this organization where we will have Professor Antonio Cano as chairman and myself and Professor Shaudi as speaker. We wait you the 14th of September, 2022 at four o'clock Central European time.
for that uh, webinar on patient perspective in front of HRT. And uh, I would like also to invite all of you next 11, 14 of May in Florence. We will be all there. I thank Mark and Nick uh, of being with us in Florence at the 20th World Congress of Gynecological Endocrinology. Don't forget it. If you have the possibility, come. If you cannot come, please register online because all the Congress will be also available directly online. And this will end by that way. You will enjoy the fact to participate with us to the beautiful scientific event in that fantastic city. Dear friends, thank you for being with us. Thank you from Viatris and from the International Society of Gynecological Endocrinology to have participated to that beautiful webinar on individualization of menopause hormone therapy. Thank Mark, thank you.